Hi, how's it going? Today is a departure for me. This is the first welder I'll be looking at that was actually sent to me by the company. DecaPower reached out to me to see if I would like to take a look at their Pulse MIG machine. I get requests all the time from welder brands and I normally pass. When DecaPower reached out, rather than wanting to change what I do, they actually wanted me to do a full test of their machine, complete with output testing and teardown. I made it clear that I would only do it if I could be completely open and honest and leave nothing out, good or bad. And here it is. So I was sent this machine for free, but they aren't paying me for the review or offering commissions on sales or anything like that. I will be completely open and honest. I will point out any negatives or positives, just like I would in any other welder review. This is the DecaPower UltraMig 230 Pulse. It is a 240 volt multi-process pulse MIG welder. Right now you can technically get this machine in the US, but they said they have limited US stock right now and they aren't really pushing it. And this is the European version. They are considering what all they want to change or improve for a potential North American version. The language of the machine and in the manual is all English, but they have told me that all the settings will be in metric and the machine didn't actually come with a plug on the power cord because they don't have a US plug option right now. So they ship it without a plug. I picked up a 6-50P locally and installed it myself. This machine can do Synergic MIG, but it also has a manual MIG mode that allows full control of voltage and wire feed speed, as well as gas pre and post flow, inductance, burn back, and a run-in setting. The Synergic MIG mode works pretty much like most others. Rather than setting voltage and wire feed speed, you just dial in an amperage and the machine sets the wire speed and voltage automatically. Some machines go a bit further and have you just pick a material thickness and then it sets it based on that. On this machine, you just adjust the amperage up and down, but it does display a recommended thickness for the amperage chosen. You can also set the wire type and size and the gas used. You can't choose specific gas percentages, but you can cycle through argon, argon and CO2 mix, or CO2. In addition to manual and synergic MIG, it also has pulse and dual pulse MIG modes. Maximum MIG output is supposedly 230 amps. It can also TIG and stick weld. Output is rated at 180 amps in stick mode and 250 amps in TIG mode. It's not uncommon for TIG output to be higher because voltage in TIG mode is lower, so the output wattage is lower at a given amperage. But we'll see if it can meet all of those claims. TIG is basic lift start with no option for a torch switch, remote amperage control, or anything like that. Pretty basic mode and it doesn't come with a TIG torch. The stick welding mode has VRD and anti-stick options as well as adjustable hot start and arc force. We'll test all of that to find out if it all works. As for the included accessories, the cables are the same copper clad aluminum cables with the stinky kind of easy melt insulation that we've seen many times before. I'm sure they'll work okay, but if this machine can output what it claims, the work clamp cable would likely start to heat up if you weld very long at close to max output. The work clamp cable is only six feet long, whereas the electrode holder cable is more like eight or 10 feet long, and so is the MIG gun. The work clamp itself is fine, but it's a little bit flimsy, and I'm sure it too will heat up if you push this machine very hard. The power cord also isn't very long, so between the short work clamp cable and the power cord, you won't be working very far from an outlet without an extension cord or longer welding cables. The electrode holder is kinda huge, <laughs> Uh, it's certainly no worse than what comes with most cheap Chinese machines. It's just surprisingly bulky. The broken insulator on the end is on me. Um, it, I was moving some things around and it slipped off and fell onto the concrete floor and broke. Um, you know, it'd be nice if it didn't break, but that was on me. I mean, it didn't come that way. The MIG gun seems pretty much on par with other cheap machines that come with higher amperage MIG guns. It definitely feels higher quality than the other included accessories, which is good, but it's nothing too special. It does use the same contact tips as the MIG gun that came with the Yes Welder DP200, though the rest of the gun is slightly different. 
The machine also comes with drive rollers for solid wire, aluminum, and flux core, as well as a handful of extra contact tips and even nozzles. It comes with a liner for the MIG gun for running aluminum. It also comes with a cheap chipping hammer and a wire brush. It comes with a gas hose and welding gloves. The gas hose fitting on the back of the machine is just a hose barb, which is why it just includes a length of hose with no fittings on it and clamps. <laughs> I don't have a hose barb fitting for my gas regulator, so I'll work something out. I suppose if you're just starting out and you want a chipping hammer, a wire brush, and some gloves, then it could be nice that it comes with them. But personally, I'd rather see that money go into better welding cables. Though they probably throw those things in because they cost pennies, so eh, whatever. The overall fit and finish of the machine is okay, but not great. The main thing that stands out are just a couple gaps here and there that just make it look a little bit not, you know, refined. And the display here is, um, well, it's got some kind of a coating on it, but it seems like that might be kind of hard to take off because it's kind of under the screws and the knobs. But more so than that, it's just the, the plastic panel just kind of seems pulled in and kind of warped where the screws are. Also, there are a couple of segments on the display that don't work. When you are in synergic mode and it is showing the recommended material thickness, one of the digits doesn't display properly. Not a big deal and hopefully just a one-off defect, but it stood out to me right away so I thought I'd point it out. The machine has some convenience features like the synergic mode and you know the graphical display that shows you the settings very quickly and easily, as well as an option to save or recall different settings. But it also lacks some convenience features that a lot of machines seem to have these days. It doesn't have a cold wire feed button or a gas purge button, and the cooling fan runs all the time. But it does have a full manual mode, which I appreciate. And it has something I've never seen before on a machine in this class. It has a four roller wire feed system with all four rollers being driven. On most wire feed systems, you have two rollers, with one being driven and the other just being free spinning. Some machines will have a gear that connects the two rollers so that the upper one is driven too. This can reduce wire slippage, especially when using lighter clamping force on the wire. For aluminum or flux core when you don't want to crush the wire, or when you're trying to feed heavier wire through a longer MIG gun. This machine uses two pairs of drive rollers and both have gears to the top roller. I usually only see a drive system like this on a large industrial wire feed machine. It's surely not strictly necessary for a machine like this, but I suppose if you wanted to run 045 flux core through a long MIG gun or something like that, it could be nice to have. Having four driven rollers gives you a lot of feeding power without having to set the clamping force too high. Too much clamping force can deform the wire, which can cause its own feeding problems. Basically, this welder's four-wheel drive. Before we start actually welding with this machine, let's open it up and take a look inside. While taking the machine apart, I found that a couple of the screws were stripped, making them difficult to remove, while others just weren't very tight. Not a big deal, but there is room to improve consistency there. Once I got into the machine, it's overall pretty neat and tidy. It's not the easiest to see everything, so bear with me. The board in front with the display and controls has a plastic cover over it. It's not exactly sealed, but it should at least keep it somewhat protected, especially on the side where the wire feed system is. You won't accidentally bang into the back of the board when you're loading wire and whatnot. There was also a plastic insulation sheet covering the board, which is good because the board is quite close to the outside case and there are multiple terminals with well over 300 volt DC on them when powered up. I also confirmed that the main input capacitors stay live with over 100 volts DC for a while after being turned off and unplugged. Always use caution when opening any electrical devices and avoid it completely if you aren't confident you can do it safely. Interestingly, the plastic sheet was hot glued to the board. You can see the fan on the back that lines up with a sort of wind tunnel created by the two heat sinks. The three large input capacitors are in the path of the air from the fan, as is the main transformer. Looking through the gap at the top of the board, you can see a couple of relays and the two parallel input rectifiers screwed onto the heat sinks. Looking in at this end, you can see two inductors and the fairly beefy main transformer. The control boards that don't need to be in the cooling air 
are in an upper compartment, which should help reduce dust and dirt pulled in by the fan from building up on them. They used copper for the straps inside to run from the board to the output terminals, and you can see a CT on one of them for measuring output current. Overall, it's a decent setup, but there are some things I think need to change. First and foremost, the ground is screwed to the frame on a little tab in the corner, and it's screwed right down on the paint. It was even a bit dirty under the ring terminal. Unfortunately, this is also one of the screws that was just finger tight, so the ground wire was a bit loose. When I removed the screw, there was a small spot where the paint was chipped or rubbed off, possibly from me wiggling the wire around, at least partially. A good ground is a safety issue, which is why I always point it out and why I would like to see a better effort made here. It probably would have been sufficient to trip a breaker if power were to short to the case, but the ground connection is something I'd like to see done better on a lot of machines, frankly. Another small thing is that there's nothing to protect the wires from chafing where they pass through openings in the sheet metal inside. The metal isn't overly sharp, but it would still be nice to see some kind of protection for the wires. Overall, it's not bad. The internal components don't look woefully undersized for the output or anything like that. But there are some things that could be improved. So let's get this back together and do some welding. I got a fitting for the gas hose to connect to my regulator. The included hose clamps were binding up and kind of grinding before they were even touching the hose. They both ended up stripping out before getting properly tight, so I got new clamps too. Even with the tension set pretty low, the machine feeds wire really well and the wire feed system is surprisingly quiet. It's probably overkill, but it seems to work really well. In normal MIG mode, I found the Synergic tuning pretty good. I could turn the amperage to any setting and just weld. It ran pretty smooth without any tweaking. In Synergic mode, with the machine set at 230 amps, it put out closer to 210 amps. At other settings, it also tended to output a bit less amperage than the setting. MIG is a constant voltage process, not constant amperage, and it wasn't terribly far off, so it's not that big of a deal as long as you're aware of it. In manual MIG mode, you can go a bit higher on the settings than it goes in Synergic mode and turned up just a bit from the Synergic settings, it was outputting 230 amps no problem. So it is more than capable of the 230 amps it claims. And it ran smooth at that amperage. Pulse mode on steel runs pretty smooth with 9010 gas, maybe even smoother than the DP200. But it was more finicky about wire stick out. I could go from 90 amps to 230 amps and the Synergic settings were always usable, though I'd say at times the voltage seemed a bit high. Sometimes, especially in dual pulse mode, it would just stutter if I had too long of a stick out. If I ran a shorter stick out, it ran much more reliably. At higher amperages, it was less picky, but it still seemed like the voltage was on the upper end of too high. I'll have to do some more experimenting at some point. Overall, I still think that pulse is best saved for thicker metal, because it is very hot, but dual pulse did seem better than standard pulse on thinner stuff. And by thinner stuff, I mean like 8th inch or even 3 sixteenths. While Synergic is the only option when using Pulse, the settings are definitely more flexible than the DP200, though I'm still waiting for a firmware update for that machine to see what they add or change. Either way, you will still want to do some testing to make sure you have the output and technique right for your project. Maybe it's just my general lack of experience with Pulse MIG, but I find it easier to dial in a setting and get a good bead with Short Arc than with either pulse mode. But I won't blame this welder or the DP200 for that right now. It could very well be me. Still, pulse probably isn't the best mode for beginners. If you push this machine very hard, it turns out you'll burn up the included MIG gun before the cheap cables or work clamp overheat, long before. The included MIG gun is just not up to the task of high amperage pulse welding. I keep saying it, but pulse is a spray process, which is really hot. When maxed out after running just a 3 to 4 inch bead, the nozzle on the MIG gun was basically on fire.
so apparently running pulse which is a spray process as I've said is quite hot apparently running pulse for you know just a maybe a three to four inch bead will basically set the uh, will set the nozzle on fire essentially there is an insulating layer between the outer metal and an inner metal sleeve, and that layer was smoking heavily after just a short weld at max output, which interestingly wasn't 230 amps, but slightly over 250 when maxed out in pulse mode. But even when turned down to between 170 and 200 amps, the nozzle was still overheating after just a few inches of welding in pulse mode. And when that inner layer starts to burn, the inner metal sleeve would actually come loose and spin free inside, making it extremely difficult to remove the nozzle from the diffuser. So if you want to push this machine very hard, you'll probably want to invest in a heavier duty MIG gun. Maybe DecaPower will include a larger MIG gun in the future. If not, the included one works okay, just not so much for high amperage pulse. We'll see how it holds up when welding aluminum. I haven't yet tested aluminum or flux core. I think that will be in another video. I did test the stick welding mode, and I thought I saw somewhere that the max output in stick mode was 180 amps, but it actually goes up to 200 amps, and it can put out the full 200 amps. And at all settings, the output is close enough to the setting that I could pick a rod, set the amperage, and it would run as expected. The bulky electrode holder isn't my favorite, but it worked okay. Ironically, this is one of the only stick electrodes that ever inadvertently arced out on me while I was setting it down, and it wasn't even in the front where I broke the insulator. It was actually at this screw. The stick welding arc is very smooth and quiet. Hot start works and gets pretty aggressive when turned up. The arc force makes a less dramatic difference, but it did seem to be working. Maybe I'll do some testing to try to quantify the output changes it makes at some point. I also tested this machine with 6010, and it ran 332nd and 1 8th inch 6010 just fine. There isn't even a separate mode for 6010, it just works. And it tolerated being set on the cold side, and even kept going through a bit of long arcing, though if I got too wild the arc would go out. Still, overall, I, I thought the stick mode was pretty good. I will make more videos with this welder eventually. I'll test TIG and I want to test self-shielded and dual shield flux core. I also want to test it out on aluminum, including pulse, and I want to compare short circuit MIG, pulse, and flux core on thick steel with cut and etch testing. So there's still a lot to do. But so far this seems like a decent machine that would benefit from some polish. Some cheap accessories and some build quality concerns slightly drag down what is otherwise a pretty decent machine. It's capable of the output it claims, normal MIG and stick work very well, and pulse and dual pulse have promise. It will be interesting to see what, if any, changes DecaPower will implement in a North American version if they make one. But right now I'd say it has quirks, but it has promise. We'll see how it does as I put it through additional tests later on. But hopefully that was helpful, and if you have any questions in the meantime, let me know. And as always, thanks for watching. Take care.